Hello, hello. Okay, so checking, check in if the stream is working properly. Someone here? Not yet. Five. Hello. Can you hear me? You can use the chat. Let me know if you can hear me. Okay. It's showing on Facebook. Very good. Okay, let's wait just a little bit to see if more people connect. Six now. Hello, hello. So we are Quantifico live from Las Granjas, Chihuahua. So everything is coming along very well. The chat is working. I can see your messages. 16 people are connected. Thank you very much. Good morning. So we are going to start <clears throat> this conference called 
The challenges of scientific publishing is part of a cycle of conferences uh, that we are making for uh, the master program in educational innovation in Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua for especially our students so they can familiarize themselves with the vocabulary and also the discourse in English about several topics of interest. And the topic of today, scientific publishing, is important because uh, students from this program uh, are centered on research and they also have to produce a thesis uh, during their, their studies and they are also expected to produce a scientific publication, not precisely in English, but that is desirable, of course. So I hope uh, you enjoy this presentation and uh, you can use the chat to leave me some questions. I can see it and I can see, you can see my screen, yeah? And then without further ado, uh, we can start. The idea of this presentation is to share with you some of the challenges that you may be facing and you might be facing in the short future about publishing your research. And you can see that the topics that conform this uh, lecture, this conference, you can see them as challenges and you can also turn them into opportunities. And of course, they are also uh, opportunities to develop yourselves. And also you can see them as pieces of advice. All right. So let's start. Let's see if I can advance. All right. First and foremost, as a librarian, I can tell you that the first things you should learn how to do is to search for information. Here, here it is. Search for information is the first one. And then as you are conducting research, you have to learn how to use at least one style manual. Fortunately for you, uh, your university has chosen one particular format because you may find when you are publishing that perhaps you have to handle more than one uh, publication or style manual because there are many 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 different ones and we are using in our university perhaps the most uh, streamlined and the most common one that is the APA from the American Psychological Association and as I say, and I, as I used to say, if you learn how to use one style manual, then you can use whatever you want, whichever uh, style manual you want. And APA is one of the easiest uh, to learn, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and then you can see that uh, by the end of past year, APA published a seventh edition that simplified some things I think is better over the sixth edition, but perhaps you already know how to handle the sixth edition and you are like, uh, look here in the meme, uh, you are not afraid of using it, but then Yoda tells you that you will be because you have to change some things with the new edition. And of course I say that APA is uh, superior to other ones because if you don't like uh, APA, if you find it too difficult, well, try Chicago. That one is difficult. All right. And this is also another piece of advice that is, also, that is associated with the previous one. Write and cite, cite as you write. Don't leave citations for later. Whenever you are using a document to write, uh, your work, your thesis, your article, the best thing you can do is that the first idea you take from a given document, you have to write immediately this, the reference by the end of your work, and then 
the citation next to the ideas you are copying because then you can forget where in which document you took a given idea and also you can forget the page where you took the idea so you must cite while you write <clears throat> Then another very librarian associated advice is to develop information skills. And this is related to a practice and research area that is called information literacy. So if there are any librarians in the audience, they may, might know about this area, information literacy. We can say that an information literate person can identify, find, evaluate, apply, and acknowledge information. We can uh, talk about literacy at a basic level if we only uh, talk about literacy as a concept. We are referring to the abilities to write and read, right? But in this case, it refers that you are literate in using information. And in the other figure, you can see that it's important that you uh, are conscious of what your information needs are. If you are researching about a topic, you might find that in the search engines, the databases and the indexes where you have to find information, you cannot use searches in natural language. As opposed to natural language, you use keywords that are the most important or they represent uh, the essence of what you are searching. And they are specialized words that you have to use. And you have to be conscious about what you really need in order to define how to search it. And then you, know, you have to know how to access the good information uh, places, portals, where you have to seek. If you are conducting research, then perhaps the usefulness of newspapers and uh, regular websites and blogs is limited. So you have to use specialized databases, either commercial or free databases, uh, repositories, Google Scholar, for example. And you have to use the information uh, legally and ethically, and this relates to citations, to properly acknowledge your sources, the sources of, of information you are using, because you are recognizing the credit of the author. Nothing comes in research from divine inspiration, right? Very good. And then, of course, you have to evaluate the information you are using. If it comes from a proper authority on the subject, if, it's a, if it is another researcher, if it is uh, an organization, a, a well-known organization, a non-governmental organization, etc., right? Then another piece of advice is to employ software for research, right? Nothing is better or easier if you put some software into it. The use of software is intended to make things easier for you. And for instance, we have calendar and task management tools, such as Google Calendar and Evernote, that allows you to organize yourselves in a better way, and also to set reminders of meetings, of workshops, of classes, right? Then another piece of software that is very important are the information systems, databases, repositories, directories, and indexes. In these places, you are going to look for your information and your documents, the documents to produce your own research. Of course, to produce research is to read others' research and to build upon 
this foundation, right? You have to use others' research to ground your own, also to know if what you are researching is worthwhile, if it's a new topic, how well known it is, right? And it can guide you throughout all the research. You can set the research problem and then develop your literature review. And of course, you need to know about methods and to ground your methods and know how they have to be applied. And then in the discussion of your work, you are cross-referencing your findings with other researchers' findings. So the use of literature is very important. And then how you handle literature? Well, there are some uh, kinds of software that are very important. These are the reference managers, such as Mendeley, Sotero, RefWorks. There are many, many different ones. And these softwares allows you to create or develop a sort of uh, private digital library of academic and scientific documents. And in this way, uh, the software makes it very easy or easier to handle and manage your own library of documents. If you want to cite them, if you want to read them, highlight them, comment them, right? And also organize them in a way that they are uh, easier to use for yourself. Okay, we have a question about APA 7. So Frank Leva says that I tried to endorse the seventh edition, got it on pre-order with my students, bachelors in psychology. However, they wanted to wait until it's fully implemented in Mexico, meaning until it's properly translated and incorporated in our college. Based on the last edition, when do you think the seventh uh, edition will be fully used in our country and that is an important question and I don't know what are the plans uh, from the publisher Manuel Moderno who made the previous uh, three translations I suppose they are going to translate the seventh but I think they are running late because the manual is available has been available for the past six months, and I think it's important uh, for them to translate it because we shouldn't be applying it directly to works uh, written in a language different than English if we don't have the translation of the uh, manual. So the translation is vital to have it. In any case, anyway, I'm preparing an update of my famous guide of APA 7. I should be ready, uh, hopefully, next week, where I adapt the seventh edition. I make some uh, adaptations so we can use them in Spanish, based, of course, on the previous translation and also from my uh, experience as a librarian, because what do librarians do? Well, we organize and describe documents. So you have that. All right, let's continue. Another piece of software that is your bread and butter is a word processor. And of course, the most uh, used one is Microsoft uh, Word. And it's of course the one I recommend, not because I like Microsoft, but because it's the best one. It's, there's no discussion about it. It's the best one because it has all the functions you will ever need and most people and most students just scratch the soft surface of the use of Microsoft Word. There are many different things that you can do, advanced things you can do with Word, and it's a very wonderful piece of software. Then you have your data processing uh, tools, the SPSS, if you conduct quantitative research and other pieces of software such as Atlas T, if you conduct qualitative research, and there are many other ones. You can also, uh, engineers might uh, know more uh, or may know better software for statistical analysis such as R, but that is uh, harder to use 
for social and uh, scientists and also uh, scientists in the humanities, right? You also have software for visualization and presenting. PowerPoint is for presenting and for visualization. You may have other softwares where you can input data and make uh, different and better figures, right? And then you have anti-plagiarism software. So you learn the ideal way to use anti-plagiarism uh, software is for learning, for avoiding plagiarism. Because you, when starting your career as researchers, you might uh, not know how to properly cite, and then the software might help you to identify what is considered uh, plagiarism and what is not. And this is very important because uh, before uh, delivering your thesis and, of course, the, uh, before submitting articles, all right? So let's go ahead. You have to familiarize yourselves with the IMRAD and what the hell is IMRAD? IMRAD is, refers to introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And this is the canon of research articles. This is the typical way in which research articles are written. Of course, scientific journals have different kinds of articles. Any scientific journal can have an editorial that is an introductory note that the journal editor writes, presenting the journal issue, talking perhaps about relevant issues in the within the areas of the journal, and presenting the articles. You can have also columns. Uh, these are papers that are mostly uh, or are more journalistic in nature, they can have the opinions of the authors of the column. You can have book reviews. You can have reviews. There are different kinds of articles. That is why I intend to mean. To mean. But the typical ones are research articles. And the typical way they are presented in is through the IMRAD format. In the introduction, you say why you conducted your research and why is it important. In the methods, you say how you conducted your research. You are talking about epistemology. You are talking about methodology. You are talking about the design of instruments. In the results is the what. What did you find? with your methodology. How can you summarize that? What was the answer to your questions? How can data be analyzed? And then in the discussion, you say the so what? Why should we care about your findings? Why they are important? What do they mean? And what do they mean next to other research in that field. And you have to comment your findings. You found such things, and this is particularly uh, relevant because other researchers in other countries found similar things. Conversely, you might have found something that contradicts the research from other people. So, then we have another question. What is the recommended number of citations for an academic article? And this can vary very uh, widely because journals will have different uh, requirements uh, related to the article length, to the extension. Some may ask for articles around 3,000 words long, 5,000, 10,000, or even 20,000. Well, 20,000 is a very long article. And then uh, 
references might enter in the word count. And that is very challenging because uh, we have to fit our contents and fit our references within a given a finite word count. But in any case, references should be, if we divide the article in 10 uh, parts, references should be at least one part of the tenth, one tenth of the article. It depends, of course, in the length. It should not be, um, we should not do articles in such a way that uh, we put so many citations and that these are not so meaningful. So we have to pick our references carefully so they not conform uh, more than one tenth of our article. All right? Of course, a thesis will have many, many more references than an article. For a thesis, a uh, hundred references, 200, 300 references is very standard. Of course, I'm talking about a master thesis and PhD thesis. Perhaps a master thesis can have 200 references and a PhD can have three, uh, 300 or 400 uh, references, right? All right. So now you know about the INRAD, you know that is called that. Then you have to follow research ethics. Perhaps your uh, thesis supervisor has already told you about research ethics, because particularly if we are in the humanities and social sciences, we are often researching with people, right? Remember, say that you are researching with people, not on people, right? So research ethics, they are based on protection to your research participants. If they are humans, and of course, if they are animals, uh, ethics, prin ethics principles also apply. The idea is to protect your research subjects. That means uh, not to produce harm, either physically or psychologically, psychological harm, and then to respect their privacy to ensure their anonymity in your thesis. Also to provide proper authorship and respect copyright from the materials you are using. And this is uh, relevant either for your thesis or both for your thesis and also for your articles and other documents. To be transparent, what does this mean? To be transparent about the methods you are applying. You have to describe very, very carefully the instruments you are applying and also how you gather your results and how you processed and analyzed your results. Because in scientific research, we have a very, very important principle that is replicability. This means that any piece of research should be uh, prone to be replicated, to be conducted again by other researchers in the same ways, and they should produce the same results. This is a hotly debated area, of course, but we are not going to go deeply into that. And also it's a good idea in theses and articles to include the ethical, ethical considerations as a part of the thesis or as part of the article to say, how you respected your participants' privacy, how did you ensure your anonym their anonymity, and if your research uh, could, have, could have some potential uh, harm to them. All right, another piece of advice is to learn English, because English is the lingua franca in scientific communication. By default, most of the, the research is produced and published in English, either we like it or not, until the Chinese say otherwise, right? Before, in ancient times, the lingua franca for science, for development, 
was Greek, and then it was Latin, and then German had a very important uh, era, but currently we have English. And of course, I'm not talking about being bilingual. For me, that thing, such a thing does not exist. What I'm telling you is to learn English at least at, at a basic and technical level so you can understand the scientific discourse in your field so you can be able to read an article in your professional field and understand most of it the ideal of course uh, will be to also uh, speak and write in good english because the best journals of course are also in english there are also very good journals in spanish but you have a uh, competitive advantage uh, if you learn English. Very good, then. Another advice, manage your time wisely. And this is tricky, right? Because we have many distractors these days. We have the uh, weapons of mass distraction that are the social uh, networking tools, the social media sites, right? And we have many, many different things to do. And of course, research takes time. Ideally, you have to have time to read, to assimilate the ideas you are reading, to create. It's a creative process also. And also writing and polishing a piece of text, a document, takes time. And you have to tackle other things like meetings and workshops and classes and lectures and also the time you have to take for reading and writing. So it's a good idea to use calendar tools and also task management tools to do this better. Then a common challenge, even for uh, mid-career researchers is to choose the right journal for the article. And how do we choose the right journal for our article? There are different approaches, of course. If you have already conducted research or have read some materials about your particular research field, you can already identify some of the journals where the topics you are researching are published. Just check your references and you may might see some journal titles repeat throughout your references. And so it might be a good idea to, to check those particular journals. You can also search the internet uh, for journals and your research topics and also use the keyword call for papers. So journals may have these things called, called call for papers where they are calling for contributions from researchers about a particular topic. And perhaps they are conforming a special issue about something, about a particular uh, topic. So this can be useful also to get some journals. And also go to the websites from the well-known publishers and check the aims and scope of the journals from your field and try to see if the aims and scope include topics such as the one you have already written a paper about. There are also recommender systems. Major publishers such as Wiley, Elsevier, they have these uh, portals also, Caribate uh, from uh, Web of Science fame, they have a recommender system. These systems are just websites in which you uh, copy and paste the title and abstract from your work. Of course, you have to have it in English. You copy and paste it, and the system will tell you, well, from us, you have this and that journal, and the uh, coincidence rating is uh, this and that you have 90% coincidence with the, these journal uh, topics and your own abstract. And these systems uh, work fairly well. They can be, of course, uh, better because they are, of course, uh, automated. 
It also depends on what are the requirements that are enforced upon you. Perhaps uh, in your uh, study program, they are telling you, well, you have to publish in a par particular journal as long as it is indexed in this database or in this index. Perhaps it must be in Scopus. Perhaps it must be in the Social Sciences Citation Index. Perhaps it has to have an impact factor. And these things uh, drive uh, the or narrow the search for journals to those particular ones. If you don't have any requirements, well, you can pick any peer reviewed journal that you like. But perhaps you have requirements from your study program, from your uh, institution, from the agency of your country that tells you you have to publish in these particular subset or kinds of journals. Then you can also consider reputable publishers or institutions. Sooner or later, you will know which ones are the most important publishers. And we have a commercial side of things, of commercial pu of, of publishing, of scientific publishing. We have the commercial publishers, Companies such as the Big Five, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, Nature, uh, Emerald, Sage, right? You have the Big Five or Big Six, depending on how you count them. There are, of course, uh, smaller ones like Cambridge, like Oxford, but they are also associated to institutions. Well-known institutions might also have uh, journals, of course. And if you know about these institutions or you can Google them and see that they are well known and they are reputable, well, you can publish with them, of course. Keep in mind that they are about or they are over 300,000 journals, but only 35,000 around 35,000 are peer reviewed. That means that any contents that uh, arrive to the journal office, they are evaluated and assessed uh, in sort of a quality control process that in science we call the peer review because it's conducted by peers. Yeah? And also you have to consider that from those 35,000, only from 12 to 24,000 are indexed. I'm talking about Web of Science and Scopus. And you have to beware of predatory journals and publishers. This is a sort of, sorry, technical issues. Excuse me. We have to uh, go here. And I will show you right now who is to blame. Let's see. OK. So you should be able to see it again. And who did this? Aha, uh -huh, Lucy. <laughs> Okay, so predatory publishing is a sort of academic scam. So these are uh, people, businesses that seek to cheat uh, non-experienced academics by sending them invitations uh, along the lines of publish your research. We uh, will not, ch not charge you so much and we will also publish your article very fast. And this uh, is often a, la a lie. If you don't know about a given journal and publisher, uh, this might be a predatory one. They charge you for, for publishing and they don't have a peer review. And the importance of peer review cannot be understated because any journal 
that is considered academic, right, or can be considered scientific, must have a peer review system because a peer review process, because it's the quality control of science, right? It's the quality control process of science. And this is very important for scientific journals. And predatory journals do not have peer review. So they are not recognized by academic and scientific societies and stakeholders. They don't have prestige. And so uh, be careful with this. If you receive any invitations for publishing in your email and that they are saying that they are going to publish your article in three days, beware that doesn't exist just in these uh, predatory circles. If you receive such invitation, you can go to the link to the bill list and search for a particular journal or publisher name. And these people are identified, all right? <clears throat> okay, excuse me, a little break. What do you think of these writers who only publish for political or personal interests and sees their research and results. Well, uh, these uh, people should not uh, publish in scientific journals. They might be publishing in newspapers or other kinds of journals that are of political nature because one particular thing in scientific publishing is to uh, avoid having uh, political uh, biases. So I, I think I understood your question in that way. Let's continue. The publication process. It's a process. Students and professors alike uh, who go to my conferences and my workshops tell, uh, ask me, uh, how long does it take? To publish well that's a tricky question because there's no uh, particular standard for this it depends on the journal on the publisher on this on the size of the journal on how many articles do they accept how many articles do they reject how many uh, peer reviewers they have because remember, uh, also, or also keep in mind that peer review is a voluntary effort, is a voluntary activity. So many scientists and academics do not do peer review. So the pool of reviewers is very, very limited. So many journals may have uh, the particular issue of not having enough reviewers. So uh, the processing of a given article takes longer. But it's key that you select the right, the right journal from the start for your research. If you are a junior researcher, perhaps do not go uh, to the journals with the highest impact factors, with the highest ranking, because you may, may not uh, succeed, right? And then it's very important, it's vital that you follow author's guidelines every journal will have an author's guidelines because they want to receive the articles in particular ways. You have to follow the rules of the journals, the rules regarding how to present your paper. And this goes uh, from the kind of title, the extension of the title. It can include the reference formatting that you have to uh, prepare your references in and also includes the word length and all the things you might consider for writing an article. So even though you master the APA style uh, manual, you may find that a particular journal will tell you, no, we receive articles in Harvard. And then you have to learn how to uh, convert your uh, references to Harvard, and your citations. 
<laughs> you have also to prepare all your files, your text, the body of the article, your tables and figures, and you might need to submit it in different ways. Perhaps you, some journals will ask you to put them right in the um, file of the article, and some journals will require you to submit them separately. Some email will, will ask you if you have an image to submit the Photoshop or the Illustrator or perhaps the AutoCAD uh, file together with your submission. Some journals will also require you to write a cover letter. And this is a letter to the editor that goes with your article. And the letter is, of course, different than uh, saying, dear editor, I hope you're very well. No, you are just presenting your article. It should be just uh, straightforward. Uh, scientific publishing is a very old fashioned <laughs> uh, tradition. You have to follow deadlines closely. If they tell you to submit revisions in a particular date, uh, if I were you, I will do it because you can go, uh, they can reject your paper if you don't follow the deadlines. You have to manage your, your revisions and changes carefully. After you send an article, you will receive the evaluation from the peer reviewers and the reviewers, more, more often than not, will tell you what can be improved on your article and you should uh, improve in that way, your article. Of course, you can disagree with peer reviewers, but you can you have to uh, disagree and argue why you disagree with them uh, in a, an academic and scientific way with evidence. And then the editor will uh, consider both both sides of the issue and then make a de decision. And of course. If this process is so complicated, you have to be motivated throughout. How long will be wise to withdraw a paper from a journal? For example, if they take too long to get reviewers. And this is a question that gets asked more and more often. And perhaps we have a, a very serious issue within Spanish language journals right now because they are taking so long and they are taking um, a time or a period of time that is unreasonable. What is un unreasonable? Well, if you don't receive a reply within three months, you can consider to withdraw your article. Because at least you have to uh, have an acknowledgement from the editor that they received your article that, and that is currently being peer reviewed. This within the three months. If it's not evaluated during six months, then withdraw it. We have had cases in which colleagues and also students and even ourselves have sent articles to journals and almost a year has passed and we don't know anything about it and it's, it's still processing the article and it's not uh, it's not being evaluated in almost a year that is unreasonable and i think that is a critical uh issue that we have to uh, discuss within uh, Spanish-speaking countries and uh, scientific state, st stakeholders, sorry, uh, to see how we can correct it, correct it. So as a junior researcher, what should I be looking for in a journal? Since you mentioned that journals with a high impact factor can reject our paper, which signs will indicate a good journal for your first article? Well, your topic, first of all, your topic must fit very well within the aims and scope of the journal and you have to make sure that they, they have published um, similar research to yours. Some journals even have uh, some uh, 
limitations or they have their scope limited to a given research tradition. Perhaps the journal publishes only quantitative studies and if your, to your study is qualitative, they will not accept it, of course. So it must fit first the aims and scope. And then regarding the impact factor, you, ha uh, you have different uh, ranges of impact factors uh, within different fields. Uh, it's not the same throughout all disciplines. So you have to see how well they are ranked, a particular journal, how well it's ranked within, within all journals in the field. It's in, if it's in the, the top, in the first quartile, because we talk about quartiles when we are talking about uh, impact factor and journal rankings. We are talking about quartiles. The first quartile, the second quartile, the third, the fourth. Uh, if you seek to publish in the first two and you don't have uh, much experience and you might not be so confident that your research is groundbreaking, uh, don't try uh, the first two you might try with the fourth or the third quartiles, right? If you are new to research, then it's not a good idea to publish in plus one, for instance. Those are the kinds of things you must look for. Let's continue. Survive the dreaded peer review process. Keep in mind that about 40% of the manuscripts are rejected on their first version. So if you send an article to a journal and it gets rejected or, or you get a major revision decision, uh, don't get sad. <laughs> this happens uh, more often than not. And 40% is a very standard uh, number. It means that for every 10 articles, four get rejected in the first version, right? And different things happen in different disciplines, right? You can have a larger number. There are, there are journals that reject 90% of the papers they receive. So there are different things you can make to ensure that your paper does not get rejected. You used good sources, you grounded very well your research, you are transparent, you were transparent on the application of your methods, your findings were significant, were important for your field, and then you can ensure that you have much success. Of course, you, can, you have to also fulfill the requirements of the journal, the author guidelines, follow them very well. Some articles get even rejected because they don't use the style manual for referencing and citations uh, uh, properly. That is why it's very important that as students, you learn how to use the APA for, uh, publication manual because many articles are rejected just on the grounds that citations are not good. And why they are rejected? Because this is just uh, <clears throat> perhaps a, a surface level um, issue. Fair enough. Perhaps you can you will not see it as important. But any reviewer, any editor uh, looking at a manuscript that is uh, with bad citations and bad referencing can say, well, if the authors were not able to properly use the publication manual, what can I expect from the science they are presenting? Think about that, right? Am I right? And also, yeah, I uh, told you about follow the publication guidelines, cite them very well. Ah, also the style, the language style. If you are sending manuscripts to journals, if you are new into scientific publishing, you have to keep in mind that you have to write very well. Yeah? You will not send a first draft to a publisher or a journal. 
you have to polish them and to simplify the way it's written to improve the writing style. Articles get, get also rejected due to bad writing style. <clears throat> So the real question was, what do you think of these writers who only publish for political or personal interests and skew the research and results? And it arises because I found a PhD thesis from a recognized university, but it is too inclined in a strange political interest. All right, <clears throat> for that, we have uh, ethical guidelines for scientific publishing. And this is uh, a topic that is coming up and uh, this is getting more and more important. Of course, uh, research should not be biased towards anything, towards, uh, especially towards a uh, political idea. Of course, so what, what do I think? Is that they should not exist. <laughs> ah, it's the next, uh, it was the next slide. So, COPE is an organization that was created as a way to suggest the best practices regarding publication ethics. And anyone, uh, if they are a journal, a publisher, or an institution where science is produced, can take these guidelines to have the best practices regarding ethics. If we're talking about journals, COPE grants, uh, well, performs an evaluation of the ethics or of how a given journal handles ethical issues and grants a seal of approval. That is uh, one way COPE uh, works. But it also provides advice and case studies and discussions about uh, misconduct, about issues of authorship, about biases in research, and uh, these different things that uh, are ethical consideration or ethical concerns in research. And we have 10 different kinds of uh, practices that they have. I suggest that you check the website of COPE. Uh, they have very uh, useful resources regarding research uh, and publishing ethics. Also be open access friendly. More often than not, researchers are in a way uh, forced to publish their research in commercial journals. Why is that? Because commercial journals have many different uh, <coughs> Uh, commercial publishers, sorry, have many different journals that they, that they don't charge authors to publish. And in developing countries, we have the issue that more often than not, our research is not funded. And if we publish in a journal and the journal charges an, uh, an article processing fee to publish, <clears throat> then it's up to the researcher to find the money to pay for the research for the publication. So that's why the commercial <clears throat> side of the scientific publishing has uh, grown so much. And this is not new. But then even within commercial journals, some of them, them gives you the opportunity to share a version of your research in open access that you can either deposit uh, the version you can share uh, from your document within your website or ideally in an institutional or international repository. This is a very long and we can, we can have uh, even uh, a whole conference about uh, how to make our research open access. But the issue here is to try and search journals that allows you at least to publish a version of your work in an open access uh, site, right? That is, that is one of the important considerations. 
or publish in open access journals if you have the money for that or if the journal does not charge for publishing. Because remember, uh, even if you have an open access publisher, someone has to pay for the servers, for the technicians, for uh, the copy edits, for everything that the journal, uh, to sustain the journal. So that, that's why even open access journals uh, char can charge uh, an article fee. Why am I uh, telling you this uh, piece of advice? It's because the more access people have to your publications, the more people will read your documents. And the more people uh, reading your papers will mean uh, more citations or a higher citation probability. Because as a researcher, you, you want uh, your colleagues to read your work and, of course, to get cited. Because if you are a member of a researcher system and you get funding based upon a researcher evaluation, uh, you should get citations to be well evaluated. That is one of the indicators that is evaluated or in which uh, a researcher evaluation is based upon. And this is related to the next issue or challenge. And you should learn about uh, or learn some bibliometrics. And bibliometrics is an area of research and practice that studies the flows of publications. What it was, that was a quite abstract way to look at it. Bibliometric evaluates the citations and the how well uh, journals are doing and they evaluate scientists and countries and institutions and disciplines and how publications are behaving, how many publications are being produced in this field, how much are they getting cited, who are the authors with most citations, what are their indicators. Bibliometrics have many different indicators and at least you should know a little bit about it in order to assess your own indicators. And for this, it's important that you make sure that you have uh, your correct profiles, that uh, if you have published before in a Scopus indexed journals, you must make sure that Scopus has a record about you and that your name is correctly written in it. And this is a very long topic. <clears throat> and there are also more uh, uh, social media-ish uh, sites that are for researchers, such as Academia and ResearchGate, and you should have a profile there. But when sharing your research, you should share it first and foremost in an open access repository before academia and research gate. Why am I saying this? Because these sites are corporations, right? And open access sites are owned by institutions, educational institutions, uh, scientific societies. And it's more important that you put your open access research in this side rather than in a commercial side. Right? But of course, your profile should be complete because you should be everywhere, right? And you should have also your profile in Google Scholar. And in Google Scholar, in Scopus, you can set citations, citation alerts. So the system will send you an email anytime one of your documents gets cited. Why is this important? Well, you have to know who cites you and how much they cite you. Because if you are evaluated as a researcher, you will need this information. And this is related to the next point. Understand evaluation systems. How do they work? And the most common way in which they work is that they consider first and foremost 
bibliometric indicators. That's why it's important to know about bibliometrics. Then promote, communicate, and disseminate your research. This is key to enhance the visibility, impact, and citations of your work. And this is tricky because if you are a professor and a researcher, uh, you have little time to communicate your research, but if you promote your research, you are the first promoter of your research. And if you promote it, more people will see it. If more people will see it, more people will, it, will read it. You know what I mean? You know where I'm going? Yeah? And then the next piece of advice is to follow and watch Quantifico. So perhaps you know about my channel. You can see the videos in my Facebook page, or you can go to YouTube and please subscribe. That helps me a lot. I'm about to release uh, the videos uh, about the APA uh, seventh edition. These contents are in Spanish. Yeah. We have another question considering Considering that most Mexicans have two last names, it is wise to hyphen our last names when publishing? Yes, definitely. We have the issue in uh, Spanish-speaking countries that we tend to give credit to mom and dad, right? So uh, we use uh, the two last names. The issue comes from the fact that if we send our research to a journal that is indexed, indexes work with processes that are automated. So if we, they see our names, for instance, my name, Juan D. Machin Mastro Mateo, if they see all these names, the system will pick the last piece of uh, the name as the last name. If I don't put an iPhone, un guion, between my last names, the system will think that my last name is my mother's last name. And that is not correct, right? If you use your two last names in your articles, the best piece of advice is to use an iPhone between them. Otherwise, you will be uh, known with your mother's last name, even though you put your other last name, right? Okay, so uh, I hope you uh, check the channel. And that is all from me. I can uh, open some minutes for questions. You can put the questions in the chat. And I can see them. You have on the screen also the links to my uh, social media sites. I put much materials on these uh, topics on my Facebook page. Of course, I also share my publications there. And there are also the videos from Quantifico that are published in Facebook and also in the YouTube channel. Of course, these slides will be there as well in the following hours. Any questions? I'll give you some minutes to consider them. I will not go away and just be waiting for your questions. Thank you, Gladys. Thanks for watching the stream. Have a nice day, too.
Thank you, Frank. Good luck, success. Oh, have a great Teacher's Day. <laughs> you too. All of you, any teachers in the audience? Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Laura. Any questions? It's all clear. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you, Hector. Okay, one more minute for questions. Thank you, Rene. Thanks for being here. Thirty seconds. <clears throat> Thank you all for uh, watching the conference. And also be in touch because I, as I told you, there are many videos you can watch and they are fully in Spanish. Quantifico is in Spanish. Okay, shall we go? I hope you have a nice day, a nice weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.